From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Monday the 27th, 3 p.m. in London, 10 a.m. in New York, 30 minutes into the trading day in the United States. From London, I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele over in New York. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Alex, yields up, take down. Yep, it's sort of the replay from last week. What do you do with financials? And plus, you add on that higher energy prices, and you're seeing the industrial cyclicals, I should say, outperform. So I'm calling it the reflation recalibration we saw at the end of last week after the Fed meeting, continuing now. Uh, the Russell 2000 up by one percentage point. If you have higher inflation, typically, that's good for the Russell 2000. Idiosyncratically, though, you may have individual issues. The S&P Energy Index also catapulting higher. Uh, the best performing names in the S&P are all the energy guys, like Marathon, Occidental, because you have New York crude here uh, up by over 2 percent, 75 Brent almost touching 80 Goldman out with a call that you could see $90 oil there. All of that's to say we have 10 year yields pushing higher here. At one point we kissed that 150 level. Well, we're now at the highest level uh, since June of 2021. Uh, How long does the playbook have to run? That is really the question. So to kick it off, we wanted to highlight some of the top stories this morning and kind of what kind of risks we could be seeing to the market that would disrupt any of that. So I want to focus first on the Fed. Eric Rosengren says he is going to be uh, retiring for uh, some kidney uh, for, for some kidney issues, and we want to see what that winds up meaning for the market. Michael McKee uh, is here with us. All right, Mike, what does it mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean a whole lot yet, but it could have big implications next year. After 14 years as the head of the Boston Fed, Eric Rosengren is retiring September 30th, which is Thursday. So he's coming. He's leaving uh, very quickly, and a lot of people are tying that to the controversy over asset trading. He and Rob Kaplan of Dallas trading assets that the Fed was buying last year. But Rosengren says it is because he has a kidney problem that has been exacerbated by the crisis over the last year. And so the best for him medically to resign so that he can, as he said, focus on my health issues. Now, we knew that Rosengren was going to be leaving because his mandatory retirement age comes up in uh, June of next year. So this is much quicker than that, but the Boston Fed had already started the search process, so it does look like they will be able to get a replacement, perhaps in time, for the first of the year. And that replacement is obviously going to be important because we're going to see a lot of turnover at the Fed as they approach a critical year, not just with tapering, but with inflation picking up. And you see what's happening with oil prices, natural gas prices today. Jerome Powell, of course, uh, his term as chairman ends in January. Richard Clarida, his term as vice chairman and his term on the Fed end in January. Randy Quarles is gone at the end of this month as the vice chairman for supervision. The question is, does he stay on the board? And now Eric Rosengren. So it's going to be a very busy couple of months for the Biden administration to try to choose who's going to stay, who's going to go. And now we have the regional banks starting to lose people. And that's going to raise the issue, too, of who votes on what next year and what do they think. Yeah, it's uh, another layer of complication on top of what is already a fairly complicated picture for the Fed. Mike, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Mike McKee on all change at the Fed. We'll see what happens with the chair, of course. Let's talk about politics. House Democrats heading towards a showdown this week uh, over President Joe Biden's economic agenda with a planned vote uh, on a $550 billion infrastructure package. Amory Hordern, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joining us now. Does Pelosi have the votes? Well, she clearly didn't have them for today, which is what uh, chair of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, told CNN this weekend. So she says there's going to be a vote on Thursday. The measure will, bought, will be brought to the House floor for a debate starting today. And uh, the Democrats will be meeting at 5.30 p.m. starting today, which kicks off a very, very busy week. So what really comes down for Speaker Pelosi on Thursday is whether or not she can bring the progressives on board to have this vote on Thursday on bipartisan infrastructure, which this is the deal she had worked out to bring it to the floor today with the House moderates. So the next next few days is going to be very critical to see what gets done with that budget package, the soft infrastructure via the reconciliation to get enough progressives on board to vote for that bipartisan infrastructure agreement, which she says she'll have a vote for it on Thursday. 
All right, Emery, thanks a lot. Lots to catch up on with that. Emery Herdern uh, from Bloomberg. All right, let's get to commodities. As I mentioned, oil rallying to the start of the week on signs that the crude market is tightening amid that global energy crunch. Now, the latest knock-on effect of the power crisis is higher oil prices, and that energy crisis happening in Europe, the UK, could spread elsewhere as well. And this all stems from a fundamental supply and demand imbalance in the short term across the globe, whether you're looking in, in shipping or chips or other kind of products. Joining us now to examine that story from the Port of Los Angeles is Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Hey, Ed. Yeah, Alex, there are dozens of ships over my shoulder waiting to get a berth in port, and they're waiting on average 9.5 days to get a berth. And when they do get a berth, they're confronted with labor shortages, a backlog on road and rail that means containers are taking far too long to get off. We are at record levels of delay here at Port of Los Angeles, which handles 40% of container imports for the U.S. and 30% of exports. But this is not a story localized to America. If you look at the shipping rates between Asia's busiest ports, Europe, North America, Latin America, we we're seeing a sharp uptick. Why? Partly because of a shortage of containers, but also policymakers in China are not afraid to shut major ports to fight a spreading Delta variant in mainland China. Seven out of 10 of the world's biggest ports are in China, and this point of origin backlog is really compounding what we're seeing here in the United States. You know that we have shippers, including Costco, Walmart, Ikea, basically ramping up and stockpiling in anticipation of a busy holiday season, and they're doing so with higher input costs. It's not just the ports, but roads, as I said. The main contributor to that rise in port in uh, freight costs is a lack of drivers right now, which is weight, uh, rising wages, and the cost per mile is really soaring. The question going forward is how do we fix this, and we'll be speaking to key names here at the Port of Los Angeles throughout the day just to get that answer. Looking forward to that conversation continuing. Ed, thank you very much indeed. Ed Ludlow joining us in Port of L.A. He's going to be back with us in the next hour. Uh, Gene Taroka, Port of Los Angeles Executive Director, joining us to continue the conversation, as I say, 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. here in London. The Times, of course, will be in L.A. for that conversation with Ed. Um, OK, let's talk about what is happening in Germany. Olaf Schultz of the centre-left Social Democrats appealing to potential partners to join him in a new German government. He wants them there as soon as possible. Is he going to get his way? The German election incredibly close uh, overnight. Uh, and Birgit Jenin joining us now with the latest. Schultz is putting the call out to form a German government. Uh, he's looking at the Greens. He's looking at the FDP. Birgit, how long is this process going to take? How long before we get a German government? Well, Schultz said he wants to form a government before Christmas, but we do know sort of how long it lasted last time. That was almost six months. So um, we, we really don't know yet. I mean, the, uh, Schultz says he wants to engage now in talks with the FTP and the Green, and we'll, it will very much depend on whether he is going to get the support of both parties. But that's going to be difficult because the, uh, the, the uh, FDP and the Greens are not exactly on the same page, especially when it comes to the fundamental big issue of climate change. The um, Greens want to basically have a very interventionist policy and also put up a lot of public money, while the FDP says we want to have a more liberal, a more market approach, and we do not want to spend more money. So this is a sort of a, a contradiction, a sort of um, a, a trying to square the circle which Scholz has to somehow manage. All right, Brigitte, thank you very much. We're going to be fascinating and to follow this over the next uh, couple of days and hours. Um, all right, Brigitte Gannon, thank you very much. All right, coming up, the rotation out of tech into financials. Is it just kind of getting started with yields really pushing higher now? Valerie Grant, Alliance Bernstein, Senior Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager, uh, will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. From London, I'm Guy Johnson. Alex Steele is over in New York. This is Bloomberg Markets. Alex, government bond yields rising around the world. Very much putting the focus back onto the reflation trade. Abigail Doolittle digging into the details.
Hey there, Guy. Well, there is a fine line between reflation and inflation. Today, tech is down as the tech shares are really seeing it more as inflation valuation concerns. But reflation, here is the 10-year yield on the year at the highs at 177 or thereabouts, then in, 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 but more recently back at 150. So putting, again, reflation and inflation back into focus. As for what it's helping from a reflationary standpoint, it's all about the banks, energy, materials, those sectors that are tied to the economy and a recovery. Uh, we have those all sharply higher over the last week to month. Nice, nice gains uh, for those uh, sectors, as you can see right here over the last week. Energy, financials, materials, and industrials. So the cyclical, the value trade is back on. And then if we tie it into uh, small caps, this is really super interesting, too. If we go into the Bloomberg terminal and we take a look here at the 10-year yield in white, and then in blue, we have the Russell 2000, so a piece of that reflationary trade to the S&P 500. We we see more recently the Russell 2000 has been underperforming as yields came in. But now, Alex, as we have yields backing up, you can see that small cap stuck in a range this year, but starting to outperform at least just a little bit relative to the S&P 500. I know it's like trying. It's trying really hard. Abigail, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, Guy, I'm going to try and make the connection here. So the news that just broke is that Harvard Business is going to move their first year students online after an outbreak. We have the reflation trade kind of going on as things continue to reopen despite Delta. What happens if we start to shut down again in some ways, even if it's pockets? What does that do to this narrative that the market's now well, uh, more aggressively starting to price in? Well, let's go back to what, what Abigail was just talking about, reflation or inflation. We're going to talk about uh, what is happening at the Port of L.A. a little bit later on. They're experiencing huge problems because they can't get truck drivers. There are shortages across the country because, as Powell said on Friday, you've got a tight labor market at the same time as you've got high unemployment. I, this is just a bizarre situation, and the virus is kind of the key to all of that. So we could end up in a situation where we continue to see inflation pushing higher because you don't have the staff to be able to deliver what you need to be able to deliver for the economy, and you can't get the stuff from around the world because of supply chain bottlenecks caused by the, the virus in parts of Asia or in key commodity areas. So I think these things are all connected. We haven't talked about the virus for really quite some time. But I, I wonder whether or actually it's going to become more of a story, more of an inflationary narrative as we work our way through the winter. Yeah, you have to wonder, though, too, what all the combo does to consumers' growth expectations and inflation expectations. Yeah. Because if you have these power price issues, does your inflation expectation become unanchored? And if that happens and you see the 5 to 10 inflation break even start to rise, that's a material difference for the Fed. Or you get the headlines about we're shutting this down, we're going online, we're shutting this down. Does that kind of weigh on your spend anyway? And then you're sort of in a short-term well, stagflation it, scenario. It, it's going to make you cautious, isn't it? The, the higher energy prices are effectively a tax, which is going to, in theory, slow the economy down mm -hmm. uh, and provide a short-term inflationary impulse, you could argue, uh, in some of the numbers. So, yeah, no, I think it all definitely comes together. But I think what you may see, and the data are abundantly clear on this at the moment, we are going through a slowdown. So this whole kind of, we're going through a slowdown at the same time as we're talking about the reflation trade. Go figure. Yeah, exactly. So what do you do? Well, Valerie Grant, Alliance Bernstein, Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager, uh, joins us now. So Valerie, do you buy in to this reflation theme, like self-tech, buy financials kind of thing? We generally stay balanced in this environment. So we've seen periods uh, during which value has outperformed, which has been the case really if you look at it on a trailing one-year basis. But if you look over a longer period of time on a trailing five-year basis, growth has significantly outperformed. And so my perspective is it's important to remain diversified in your portfolio in terms of the factor exposures in the same way that you maintain a level of diversification across sectors. Because these regime changes can happen very quickly. And I think that over the long term, uh, obviously, depending on your time horizon, it really inures to your benefit to maintain a level of diversification. Hmm. How do we think about that diversification? A lot of people talk about barbell strategies. In fact, so many people talk about barbell strategies, I'm almost tuning it out. But is that what we need to be thinking of here? You've got the kind of the reflation, the banks, whatever it is on one hand, uh, and, and then you've got the kind of the technology growth hmm. year end. Do you, do you basically, is that, the, is that the strategy at the moment or does it mean, need to be more nuanced? Because if you take a look at the numbers, that does seem to be the kind of the way that we're pivoting. 
Well, we have exposure to both in the portfolio that I manage, and, and, and it's a U.S. large cap core portfolio that also focuses on environmental, social, and governance issues. And so, yes, we have exposure to financials. We have exposure to te technology. We're actually underweight um, energy, which you were just discussing. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the um, COVID issue because uh, that, to me, is very important. And for some reason, we seem to have forgotten about it. But COVID is certainly not over. It's not over in various regions of the country, and it's certainly not over in various countries around the world. And for large cap companies, they have exposure to global markets. And that's what we're seeing now in terms of some of the supply chain disruptions. Mm -hmm. Many of them are, in fact, COVID related. So is there a sector that is more insulated from that? And I'm bringing us back to financials in some ways, because the supply crunches that we're seeing, in part sparked by COVID, um, if financials can be relatively immune from something like that, plus take advantage of any kind of reflation. The only financials that might be somewhat immune to that would probably be some of the regional banks. But if you're investing in uh, large money center banks or large financial institutions, they too operate uh, globally. And obviously, uh, much of their business is affected by yields. So I, I think that it's very difficult to insulate yourself from this exposure. Um, perhaps if you look more in the small and mid cap segment of the market, you'll find companies that are more sort of focused on the U.S. market exclusively, right? And so then you may not have the same type of, of uh, uh, challenges that you do with the large uh, multinationals. Valerie, I'm really struggling with this concept of reflation at the moment because it doesn't feel like reflation. It feels like we're, we're struggling. The data are not good and they are rolling over. Uh, I, I see what is happening with companies and as you say they're talking more and more about the supply chain shortages that we're experiencing and that's going to throttle back growth. Does this feel like reflation or does this feel like something else? The conversation about stagflation has started to emerge recently. Higher yields, yes. Does that necessarily mean higher growth? I don't think it, it's implying stagflation. I think what we're seeing are some of the challenges of reopening and really increasing output. We had a surge in aggregate demand coming out of the pandemic and the output or supply simply has not been able to, to meet that demand. I uh, continue to believe that although some of this inflation may be higher for longer, I think the bulk of it is transient with the exception mm -hmm. of wages. And what we hear from companies across sectors is that it is, it is really more so of a uh, employee's market than an employer's market at this time, particularly at the lower end of the spectrum, but really mm -hmm. across all segments. So then based on that, what areas have better pricing power? I mean, so far industries have been able to pass on the price increases, and I'm wondering where, which ones have extra room to do that and which ones are kind of maxing out a little bit? I think you see that it, within sectors, it varies considerably. So within consumer discretionary, there are certainly retailers and brands that have the ability to pass on costs to consumers. And then also, even in some aspects of technology, there are, there are some companies that have proprietary technology that is mission critical to organizations, and they are therefore able to pass those costs even on to other uh, companies on a business to business level. So I think it's very um, company specific, and we're probably going into to the uh, next upcoming earnings season going to see a wide range, a wide range of, of responses here. It's going to be, I think it's good. I think it's going to be a really interesting earnings season. Um, mm -hmm. I, I saw what Nike had to say the other day, the supply chain <laughs> bottlenecks they're experiencing. Uh, you hear company after company talking about this. Valerie, do you think the market has priced that in? Do you think the kind of the margin hit, the middle of the P&L story has been factored in yet? Because the expectations continue to be that these companies are going to continue to be able to power through. Is that going to be the case? I, I don't think it's necessarily priced in. I mean, the uh, corporate profits have been so strong for the last several quarters. It's just been, you know, phenomenal performance. And I think while people do, in the uh, in the back of their minds, understand that we have these issues with supply chain and COVID and, and everything else, I don't know that it's really baked into the numbers, so to speak. So I think there probably will be some surprises. Um, but quite honestly, those could create buying opportunities as well as companies that have healthy uh, outlooks over the long term perhaps have a little pressure on their uh, stock price.
Valerie, great to talk with you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today with some analysis. Valerie Grant of Alliance Bernstein, greatly appreciated. What are we going to do later? We're going to talk to the EV maker backed by Leo DiCaprio. It's going public. It's called Polestar. It's going via a SPAC. It's going to be an interesting conversation. Leo, this is are you guys buddies? Leo, hey Leo. Oh yeah. Leo, okay, cool. What do you call him? Leonardo DiCaprio. It's like, it's like a double name is his name. You have to do it that way. You can't say Leo. Apparently, I do. <laughs> so So the Swedish car maker Volvo has made a deal for its EV unit Polestar to go public. It's doing so via a merger with a SPAC, uh, the SPAC Goris Guggenheim. Bloomberg's Dave Wilson here with some of the details. Well, Guy, uh, Polestar is a company that was actually started back in 2017. You know, Volvo cars, I mean, that's, uh, you know, controlled by uh, China's uh, Zhejiang Geely. So, you know, we're talking about a China connection here. Uh, in terms of this deal, well, you got to understand, Polestar, at least, is a company that is already making vehicles, unlike others that have come public through this blank check route. 10,000 cars sold globally last year. So, you know, there are a couple of models already available and more to come in the next few years. So that's how you get to a $20 billion valuation on this company, for sure, uh, when it comes to this deal. I mean, and we're talking about Alec Gores, one of the billionaire Gores brothers, and Guggenheim Partners getting together. And, you know, this blank check company has been around since March. In July, there were reports that this deal was in the works. So you saw the shares jump up then, come back down. Now that the deal's actually happening, uh, the shares are pretty much back to where they were around their peak in July. So mm. people seeing this deal as a positive, you know, when you consider the shares were originally sold at $10 each, they're trading more like $10.70 at this point. So what does happen to the shares uh, once um, it, it, the deal's completed? Well, that becomes a real question, you know, Alex, because we have seen a lot of companies that have gone public through this blank check route you know, that just haven't done that well with investors once the deals were completed. There's something called a DSPAC index that tracks them. You know, in terms of market value, I mean, you, you can see how, uh, you know, this company would stand up at $20 billion. Uh, a, a nothing compared with Tesla or some of the others out there, and Lucid, actually, which I mentioned earlier, uh, double the valuation uh, in terms of dollars. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, just the idea that, you know, this DSPAC index, uh, it's actually peaked back in February. It's down about 40% since then, and, and it was down even more not long ago. So you do have to wonder what happens now as the deal proceeds. All right, Dave, thanks a lot. Good setup for us. Dave Wilson uh, joining us. We're going to be speaking to Thomas Ingleff, uh, Polestar CEO, in the next hour. Coming up at 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. Don't miss that. All right, coming up, we're going to head to D.C. House Democrats are on track for an intense fight over President Biden's big projects. We're going to talk to Jim Kessler, uh, a third-way executive vice president for policy. Uh, he used to work for Chuck Schumer. A good voice there. This is Bloomberg. Let me just say we're going to pass the bill this week. Uh, the, the, uh, I promised that we would bring the bill to the floor. That was according to the language that those who wanted this to be brought to the floor tomorrow wrote into the rule. We will bring the bill to the floor tomorrow for, for um, consideration. But you know, I'm never bringing a bill to the floor that doesn't have the votes. That was House Speaker Nancy Pelosi talking about the prospects of passing the infrastructure bill uh, so far this week. What's the real timeline here? I want to bring in Jim Kessler, third way executive vice president for policy, who is also a uh, former legislative and policy director for Senate uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. Um, Jim, you've been in the trenches like you've you've had to pass bills that no one wanted to pass. I want to ask specifically about that three and a half trillion dollar human infrastructure. It's always divided until the last minute. There's always drama until the last minute. Is this time different, though? I think we're in the midst of a 96 hour high wire act, but I do believe that the trapeze artists will get to the other end. And what that means is by the end of the day, Thursday, we will 
have an infrastructure bill that passes the House, which means that will go to the president's desk. And I believe that there will be a framework for the reconciliation bill, what you call the human infrastructure bill, that will be somewhat less than the $3.5 trillion that, you know, is the target right now. Somewhat less? Substantially less. I mean, look, there are a there are a lot of Democrats, even moderate, moderate Democrats, who aren't focused on what the top line number is going to be. It's really what are the priorities, what is going to get done. But, you know, my guess is it will be somewhere in the 2 to $2.5 trillion mm -hmm. range. That is my guess. There are definitely some, um, some of the most centrist senators like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema in the Senate that are looking for a number that begins with one. So, mm. you know, this is going to come, this is ultimately going to come down because there are practically zero votes to spare, zero in the Senate and three votes in the House. So two is what I've been hearing as well. Um, doesn't rule out two and a half, doesn't rule out something with a one handle. But okay, let's just for the sake of argument, say two trillion dollars. What are the chances percentage wise that the progressives tank it and walk away because they're not getting their three and a half trillion? I think it's very, very low because you can do an awful lot with $2 trillion. For example, you could do all of the climate pieces that really need to be the, sort of the centerpiece of, the, of climate change legislation that really is not being done in the infrastructure bill. That's about $700 billion. And then there are these massive middle-class tax cuts, the child uh, tax credit, the earned income tax credit, the Obamacare subsidies. That's another $700 billion. That gets you to $1.4 and those are really popular among progressives and centrists. And then there's another six, seven hundred billion dollars of, you know, cats and dogs that are important that I think we'll get in there. OK, Jim, how quickly does this money go out of the door? Some of this is long term. Some of this is short term. One of the things the markets are going to have to figure out is, are we going to see checks? Are we going to see this some of this money coming out quite quickly, which will be a short term boost to the economy just to the time at which it's struggling? So I'm wondering how the mechanics of actually distributing these very big numbers, are, are how the mechanics are going to work. Right. So the, let's say we're at the two trillion numbers on the um, reconciliation package that is over 10 years. That is spread out over time. Certainly the pieces that have to do with climate are spread out over time, but the tax credits that, you know, for electric vehicles, I mean, that'll affect industry almost right away. The child tax credit, I mean, tax are already going out to people. They will continue to go out to people. So the part that are really income supplements for folks in the working and middle class, those will continue unabated. So that the flow will be, you know, ongoing. Um, staying one more with the infrastructure before we get to debt ceiling and, and shutdown, et cetera, um, is if we get a $2 trillion bill, what does that mean then for taxes? Like, are all the taxes then, like, cut in half? What does that mean? Well, if you're looking for pay-fors, if this bill is going to be truly paid for, then, you know, it is not super hard to get to two trillion dollars in pay fors and that would mean a top rate of 39.6 percent up from 37 a corporate tax rate of 25 percent above the 21 percent that it is now but far below the 35 percent it was for the previous several decades probably higher capital gains rates maybe 28 percent for those at the very top some health care savings as well some irs enforcement that gets you to 1.5, and then there's all sorts of other things that can get you what in Washington are called nickels and dimes, and everywhere else it's tens of billions of dollars, but they can get you to the two number. Okay, so the maths kind of vaguely stacks up there. Mm. Jim, let, uh, Alex brings up the issue of the government shutdown, so let's just talk about that at the moment. How would you handicap that? Uh, if we do get a continuing resolution, how far is it going to kick the can down the road? And is the government, is the Biden administration going to want to make any change at the Fed if there's any issue over the debt ceiling? Because if it gets messy, you're going to need the Fed making sure that it's kind of got itself covered. So I'm wondering kind of how this is all going to work and how we should link these issues together. Right. So I, the continuing resolution, this is government funding. And I expect that it will be done by September 30th, by the witching hour. Um, and it will either be done 
for several months or throughout the entire year. There are different options they could do. The issue is the debt ceiling, because right now it's attached to the continuing rev resolution. Republicans are adamantly opposed to voting for the debt ceiling only because Biden is president and Democrats are in Congress. They've voted for this thing a zillion times before. Hmm. So the debt ceiling is going to have to go on a standalone reconciliation bill, most likely, and that takes time. So that is the part that I am most worried about because there is a congressional calendar that moves awfully slowly with reconciliation bills that you would that you would have to rev up. Um, so I expect it will be done, but you know this is the place where the trapeze artist can fall off the wire, mm -hmm. and we have to make sure that doesn't happen. And I think it is a tr just a travesty that Republicans are not supporting this because all of this debt ceiling increase is really about the policies that existed during the Trump era. This is not about new spending. It is the existing policies. It is allowing the debt yeah. limit to grow for the existing policies we have. Yeah, it's just, I, 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 yeah, mm -hmm. it's the political football uh, for that also. Hey, Jim, the other wild card um, that you got, Guy and I were discussing earlier are energy prices. And you have oil prices for Brent at $80. You have a U.S. crude at 75 is the Biden administration, are certain congressmen freaking out at these high prices when the path of least resistance for oil producers in the U.S. is to keep a lid on CapEx spending, a lid on production? Yeah, so I definitely, if, you know, if this was um, September 2022, with the midterms six weeks away, I think Democrats would be a lot more concerned about the political fallout of um, energy inflation right now. It's 2021. There's a lot of time for, you know, we're going to see a lot of fluctuations in energy prices between now and then. I, I think inflation, the question is, are we seeing temporary inflation that has to do with an economy that is revving up after being, you know, in a coma? Hmm. And will that transition sort of move out by the end of this year, early next year, or some of this longer lasting? I believe that it's going to transition out, but prices will will know. So I think it's a political problem if it's closer yeah. to the election. How, generally, how does Washington deal with inflation? Do they see it as a problem? Inflation is generally pretty regressive. How does it? I, what does history tell us about how the two interact? Um, because in theory, it should hit the, the weakest in society the hardest. We're seeing energy prices going up right now. Food prices are going up. There are shortages abounding. That's not going to hit the upper end of society that hard, but it is going to hit the weakest. So how does that play in D.C.? Well, it's also a very difficult problem to solve from Washington policy lever levers. I mean, you can obviously do things at the Fed, but what is that going to do with food prices? It's hard very hard to say. I mean, one of the things that Democrats are doing that are, you know, they're trying to get wages up so that wages keep pace with inflation. There's the child tax credit. There's the earned income tax credit, which um, help low um, and middle income families, you know, pay their bills. So that's the way that you, you're trying to make ends meet. But, you know, look, ultimately, you know, through vaccines and through other efforts with COVID, we also want to get more people back into the workforce. And some yep. people are still reluctant because they don't feel that it's completely safe. And then the last thing I'd say is our immigration policy has been stuck in quicksand for the last several years. So normally there'd be more folks coming into this country, taking some of these jobs, particularly lower wage jobs in, in, in the food sector and in the food production sector. That's not happening. We need to get that going, too. Yeah, I, this feels eerily familiar of what, what's happening here in the UK as mm -hmm. well. Jim, great to get your take on so many of these issues. Really appreciate your time today. A great setup for the week. Uh, Jim Kessler, third way executive vice president for policy. Um, and that takes us to the data, Alex. We, we talked to the top of the show about this kind of idea that there's a reflation trade on. The data don't speak to that. Um, the Dallas Fed Manufacturing Index coming through at 46 
It was expected at 11. The prior number was 9. We were way higher than this uh, a couple of months ago. The data mm -hmm. are edging over, and it's going to be some of those issues that Jim's talking about. You've got a shortage of materials. You've got a shortage of people. Companies are struggling. There is a throttling effect on the U.S. economy that is taking place right now. Uh, and the, the, the kind of the irony of all of this is that, in theory, w we have a fairly large amount of slack in the economy mm -hmm. from a labor point of view so in theory this shouldn't be happening but it's not and the data are slowing down well then you know you get that dreaded stagflation potential conversation also to highlight in the dallas fed it said six month outlook is now at 11.5 versus 15.1 in the prior month so even the outlook now is rolling over a touch usually like we'd see something like now we feel bad but we feel a little better out in the future now the future starting to yep. roll over a touch as well yeah, and all of this is going to be something that we have to think about when it comes to central banks easing policy. Is the Fed really on rails? Is that rate hike really going to be delivered uh, as soon as some are suggesting? Maybe not, because the economic growth story is maybe not as robust as maybe we thought it was. Let's examine one of those kind of factors in a little bit more detail. Europe's energy crisis, the potential domino effect on global economies. Amri Tassen, Energy Aspects Director of Research. Joining us next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishi Kigupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Port of Los Angeles Executive Director Gene Soroka. That's at 11.30am in New York, 4pm in London. This is Bloomberg. So you're watching Bloomberg Markets live from London. I'm Guy Johnson, Alex Steele over in New York. Let's talk about this reflation narrative that we were discussing before the break in a little bit more detail. Economists... Uh, and we're talking China now, beginning to sound the alarm on the impacts of the energy crisis and what it's doing to growth. Now, China's facing a multitude of factors right now, but one of them is energy. And Nomura, the latest house to come out and start to downgrade forecasts, really quite significantly as well. Full year, 7.7 from 8.2. Q3, 4.7 from 5.1. Q4, 3 from 4.4. These are big downgrades in terms of economic expectations. Now, China, it's not just energy. It's a multitude of factors, and we haven't really talked. I can't believe we talked about it so much last week and so little already this week. But Evergrande, the slowing down of the, uh, the property sector could have a major impact. But there's a conflagration of factors that are really coming together here. Mike McKee, Bloomberg's economics and policy editor, joining us now with more. Well, Guy, the thing about this crisis is that Evergrande is a China problem, but the energy crisis is worldwide. You know that very well, being in London. And look at what it's doing to the Chinese manufacturing economy. Because China doesn't have enough natural gas either. They are pushing down on industrial production there, the government telling some companies to close. They don't want to use coal because they want the skies clear for the Winter Olympics. And so what's happened is we're seeing supply chain problems start to multiply. Apple, just one of the companies that saw some of their suppliers shut down recently in China. And this is why we're seeing this. This price is reflecting the problems around the world. The uh, lines here show us what is going on in Asia and in Europe. And we're seeing incredible price rises. I, mean, I don't usually put this in here, but $26, $26, $27, all of those uh, around the world for natural gas. Uh, the U.S. is seeing an increase as well, but not nearly as much. That's the purple line, but it's still a problem here. We are seeing cutbacks. We are seeing e e manufacturing start to slow. And you mentioned that with the Dallas Fed survey, we're starting to see problems in the U.S. as well. We're going to see more inflation because of the supply chain problems and because of the energy problems. And that's going to be an issue for the Fed because what do they do if they were to raise rates to head off inflation? That kind of cuts the economic growth legs out from under the country and the same for central banks everywhere around the world. Yes, see, usually I'm emailing Mike just to clarify economic indicators, but today I got all the emails about natural gas. Natural and gas. Producers, what is, was going on? It's, it's, a, the supply it's a huge was. story. You can see here in the U.S. how we have less, the white line, than the blue line, than we had uh, last year. Or that's the five-year average, actually. And, of course, you can see the price. See? 
It's all about commodities. Mike, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Michael McKee. All right, for more, let's bring in Emery Descent, Energy Aspects Director of Research. Emery, let's just start right there on natural gas. Where's my supply response? Well, all of these things take time, right? And I think ultimately, and look, we've talked about this, and I know you were speaking to James last week as well. The near term, um, we are constrained because of the lack of Russian volumes. Chinese demand has still been very, very good. You're not going to get the response overnight. But while prices stay next year, should come off from these crazy levels, you've got Nord Stream 2 starting up. Structurally, we do think prices are going to be higher because ultimately, this is what happens when you are pushing energy transition to the extent that uh, policymakers and uh, companies are pushing it. You're retiring coal plants in OECD, for instance, so now gas has to become baseload for power generation. And you are therefore going to get structurally higher gas prices, which then has impact on oil as well, right? Because at the margin, oil is now getting called on for power generation. It is a bit crazy. It sounds like we're in the 1970s. <laughs> um, OK, let's think about that. What are the price implications for the other energy assets? We know that gas has gone up. We've seen oil prices climbing. Brent's at 49.46 right now. How, how much more of the, the gas effect has yet to bleed into the, to the other calories, as it were? I mean, just a few weeks ago, oil, effectively, like, say, Brent or Brent-related or linked products, um, were the cheapest um, energy product in the world. And, of course, I'm including carbon costs when you consider coal. Um, and that's why you've seen the oil rally. You know, we've been saying for the last few weeks that, look, we do think oil is poised to break higher, and Brent about $80. I mean, if there was one time in the year it would have done it, it would have been now. And mm -hmm. that's why you've seen the move higher in Brent. Now, th this is... It, it becomes a question of at what point do you choke off economic growth, right? The, this isn't an infinite amount that can switch into oil. I think that's the critical thing right now, that we are switching off a lot of industrial activity in Europe, in places like China. So this has big implications. And again, going back into the transition side of things, it becomes a question for policymakers that what are they willing to tolerate? And remember, we're coming into winter. Are we willing to tolerate like switching off lights and not having power if it's a cold winter versus clean uh, blue skies? I think this is a really interesting mm -hmm. winter coming up because of that. Well, Emrita, also, if you just take a look at the curve, the curves re-rated higher just in the last month alone as well. I mean, you're basically seeing a nice sharp divergence over the next year. And I wonder, what does OPEC do with that? What does the U.S. do with that? Because President Biden, for example, is not going to like $80 oil, but it's hard to go to U.S. producers and say pump more when the path of least resistance is pump less because of carbon emissions. OPEC also, Saudi Arabia might not like the $80 oil because of that demand destruction. Absolutely. And this is very tricky for OPEC, right? On the one hand, if you remember just the last meeting, we were talking about prices below 70, but they stood their course and said, we're going to bring back the 400,000. The coming, uh, the meeting that's uh, next week on Monday, uh, they're going to do a very similar thing. They will bring back another 400,000 barrels per day to the market. So again, the drip feed will continue. They're going to keep bringing this back uh, to the market. But again, these are very small volumes, right? And we are looking ahead and into a winter period if it is a cold winter, then that will get absorbed very quickly. The question becomes the demand destruction. At $80, you're definitely biting into that. For a lot of non-OECD countries, China, India, let's not forget India, that's why you're getting both these countries released from their SPR, and you're going to constantly get this tussle. But I do want to highlight the fact for oil, inventories are extremely low around the world. So there isn't that much of a buffer. Ultimately, you know, if prices go too high, OPEC will have to come back to the table and say, OK, we, were, we had decided it'll be 400 a day each month. Maybe we do need to bring back more quicker. Um, that's not going to happen straight away. But absolutely, that can happen in a couple of months' time. Um, quick question on Russia. What does Russia do next? The pressure is mounting, but obviously it's got its own stocks to fill. When do we start to see noises coming out of Russia that it is going to pump more? <laughs> is it after Nord Stream 2 has been uh, given its certification? I think so, yes. I mean, right now, if you look at or just hear what is coming out of them, not very much. And, yeah, absolutely, internal or domestic in Domestic inventory filling is very, very important, but politically, of course, they're going to wait for Nord Stream 2 to come online. Amrita, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Amrita Sen, Energy Aspects Director of Research. This is Bloomberg.
Let's get a check on how we're shaping up in European markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. Now, the stock 600 pretty much flat. We faded a lot of the gains that we had at the start of the session. In terms of what is moving higher today, it really is some of that reflationary trade. I point to some of these energy stocks here. Oil here like BP, Total Energies. This is as Brent pushes towards $80 a barrel. We, of course, had that petrol panic buying over here in the UK. And then, of course, I point to some of these bank stocks also moving higher, perhaps as yields in Europe generally moving higher. And that is part of that reflationary trade. Then what is moving to the downside? Really those uh, technology players and some of those semi stocks as well there. Guy, back to you. Rick, thank you very much indeed. Well, the European close is coming up next. Uh, we'll dig into the details of the German election as well. Carsten Nickel, Tenio Managing Director, joining us for that conversation. This is Bloomberg.